Hi everyone. Today we are back again with another webinar on breaking the myths on early COPD. Yes, we've been talking about it for very long and we are back with three very eminent faculties and as you know we are doing a series of live webinars which go on our YouTube and Facebook channels as well and uh, today we have with us our speaker Professor Milin Sowani. He is the consultant respiratory physician, lead clinic clinician ARCU and complex long-term ventilation, Nottingham University Hospitals, NHS Trust, visiting professor at the University of Derby as well. We welcome you, sir. And before starting off, I would also like to in, uh, invite and introduce our moderator for today, Dr. Sanjeev Nair. He is the professor at Department of Pulmonary Medicine, Government Medical College, Trisur, a chairman of Zonal Task Force for Medical Colleges in NTEP South, South Zone. We welcome you, sir, and we are very eager for you to start the session. And we also have Dr. Sandeep Salvi, our very own Dr. Sandeep Salvi, as a panelist today. He is the director of Palmoke Research and Education Foundation, Pune, India. We welcome all our panelists and faculties, and we are looking forward to a great session. Uh, Dr. Milin Savani, please get started. Uh, thank you so much, Andrila. Thank you, Sanjeev uh, and Sandeep, for inviting me, and of course, Indian Chess Society, uh, and giving me the opportunity about talking about um, one of the hot topics, really. So I will, uh, I'll try and start sharing my screen, and we will, uh, we will make a start. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. We can. And is that is it at the first slide just to be? Yeah. Right. Okay. Excellent. Um, uh, so thank you again, and uh, we'll we'll make a start. So what I'm hoping to do today to talk about early COPD, and uh, as Shakespeare says, what's in the name? Well, I'm sure, you know. Uh, by the end of it, I'm sure we'll be debating about what it should be called. Uh, is it correct nomenclature and so on? We'll look at current guidance definitions. We'll look at um, sort of published literature about uh, the, the, the evidence on smoking, lung function symptoms and exacerbations in uh, early COPD or pre-COPD or gold zero. Uh, we'll look at spirometry and radiology, uh, alternative options and potentially um, we will also then think about way forward. Um, if uh, if you have any questions, if they are very urgent or burning, uh, you know, please share. I'm not exactly sure how questions are going to be uh, shared, but I presume we would take questions predominantly at the end of the talk. Is that uh, right? Uh, uh, yes. Yes. So yes, Doctor Mellon. We will, uh, so we will collect all the questions and uh, Dr. Sanjeev Nair will moderate all those. Okay, okay, thank you, because I, I, I wouldn't be able to see any questions typed in or anything. So thank you for that. Uh, so we'll, we'll move on. Uh, so I, I thought it's worth thinking about a little bit of historical perspective as well, really. So we know that, that you know, COPD is getting more and more common. And by 2030, is going to be the third most common cause of death worldwide. Uh, the so-called COPD has been investigated and studied uh, by sort of physicians for a long time, sort of more than 200 years. Uh, in, in, in 1769, Morgagni performed some, uh, Morgagni performed some uh, post-mortem examinations and then he, he reports some turgid lung uh, and then in uh, 1814 uh, Charles Badham first coined the term chronic bronchitis and and a few years later it was Lennox you know he is of the the stethoscope fame who, who invented stethoscope uh, termed uh, or coined the term emphysema and around that time, it was air pollution and genetic factors that were thought to play uh, play a role because cigarette smoking wasn't quite as uh, prevalent. And the spirometer that we use, uh, you know, it was invented in 
1846, a long, long, long time ago. Uh, there have been some improvements uh, subsequently, but you know, by and large, we are still using a relatively old, very trusted and, and proven, but nonetheless old technology to diagnose uh, one of the really important conditions. Um, uh, so, uh, and, and moving on further. So, in 1959, in, during the SIBA guest symposium, it was thought that we ought to combine this uh, term chronic bronchitis and uh, term emphysema together. The idea was to club them together to try and then get, you know, coin one more, you know, just a single term to get more attention, more sort of. Uh, uh, funding research going into it and it was in 76 because before that it used to be called chronic obstructive lung disease and various other things uh, and in 1976 Charles Fletcher uh, uh, sorry uh, not Charles Fletcher William Briscoe is credited with uh, the term of uh, COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease um, and then, then a few years later, it was Fletcher, you know, Fletcher and Peter Fame, who who wrote the seminal book of Natural History of Chronic Bronchitis and Emphysema, and linked that to smoking. Uh, I I always find this fascinating, and although it's not exactly related to pre-COPD, the reason I wanted to bring this to your attention is just to show that journey and how the two terms of chronic bronchitis and emphysema were different. They were brought together under the the, 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 the new term of COPD. Uh, and we are now going to be again rehashing the term COPD uh, into pre-COPD and early COPD and young COPD on all sorts. You know, I'm sure you've all read the 2023 gold uh, guidance. Uh, just wanted to highlight the Fletcher and Peto uh, graph again the top line showing the normal decline in lung function, um, which declines much more rapidly in smokers. But the important thing is anytime you stop smoking, uh, it, 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 it does uh, lead to uh, the, 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 the reduction in lung function is then not quite as rapid and dramatic. It's really important uh, graph, and I'm sure all of us already know this. Um, the again, you know, further data, more recent data to confirm that smoking cessation does work. But what uh, what it what I wanted to highlight is that ideally you would want smoking cessation to be less than forty years, so that um, the lung function decline is minimal, or or, or you know, uh, and, and and patients then don't come to harm. Uh, so smoking cessation effort. The earlier we do it, the better. Um, slightly worrying thing now that's happening is A, is pollution, B, infections, including COVID. We just don't know what the long-term effects are going to be. And C, uh, vaping. Again, it's, it's you know, uh, vaping uh, is, is catching up in young people and, and, and we'll need to be vigilant as to what effect it has uh, on individuals, but on also on a population level. Um, so, um, so coming to uh, coming to gold. Uh, so it says in appropriate clinical context, presence of non-fully reversible airflow limitation measured by spirometry gives diagnosis of COPD. And then it says some individuals can have respiratory symptoms and/or physiological abnormalities and radiological without airflow obstruction. And it, it, they are calling these pre-COPD. And I'll, I'll, I'll specifically pick these terms out. And then, of course, we have the new term PRISM as well. Uh, so PRISM stands for the Preserve Ratio Impaired Spirometry. Uh, we do know that, as I just mentioned, apart from smoking, occupational exposure is really important and contributes to about 20% of symptoms. Biomass fuel and particularly air pollution is very, very important. So on the top, uh, right corner, I've got uh, a picture of Delhi with uh, smog, and nobody who wanders in that is going to be left unaffected. Um, 
childhood uh, respiratory illnesses asthma and genetic factors we need to take all this into consideration when we look at anybody who comes to us with history of smoking or or these risk factors uh, and uh, uh, respiratory symptoms what i really wanted to highlight here is that the trajectories of fev1 so fletcher and petro did amazing initial work but we know from more recent data that it's not exactly as fletcher and petro demonstrated what happens as you know i'm going to just take a little bit of time going over this so the left end or the top curve shows pretty much normal development of lung function and then gradual decline in those who haven't had smoking or other risk factors and more rapid decline in those with copd but what's interesting is you can also have another cohort who for a variety of reasons including exposure to toxic uh, toxic agents and stimuli in 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 womb to early childhood conditions where their lung growth is not quite fully and is often seen less than 80% uh, but again if they haven't had any further exposure then the decline remains slow like the ones uh, in the top curve but if they smoke then the decline uh, can be rapid and then smoke or exposure to again other toxic stimuli so i think it's important to remember that because what we don't know is at any time when we see a patient where are they on this curve you know did they have full lung development lung function which is 100% or was their lung function you know never actually reached they attained full 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 lung growth uh, so this is something to keep in mind when we look at any patient and also look at any pulmonary function test the other thing i wanted to discuss is just timing of copd diagnosis so what we can say is there is a significant proportion so if we look at uh, you know goal 2 and goal 3 so you know about 80% patients uh, get you know moderate to advanced uh, disease when they are diagnosed uh, only 20% patient get, uh, get diagnosed uh, in 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 cold one so what's happening is we are still uh, you know uh, not quite quick in terms of diagnosing these patients uh, now whether patients don't seek help or physicians don't quite cotton on to that you know they may be just 40 but you know they have had exposure to smoke and 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 and, and air pollution and so on and and uh, this could be copd uh, and this is something it's you know we really need to 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 take a look at this and and see if we could change it so that we can try and diagnose patients earlier we can intervene early and hopefully uh, that will help improve outcomes uh so so early copd uh, this brings us to early copd versus young copd versus uh, you know uh, pre copd and stage 0 so in 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 2001 gold document uh, they mentioned stage 0 copd what what is now being termed as as pre copd um that term was then taken out of gold uh, uh, gold terminology for a while uh, i suppose partly because at that time we were still more focused on treating moderate and severe patients now that we think that we are getting better at treating these patients uh, we want to now start looking at people who might have been you know who might be very early in their uh, disease journey so the term has been re uh, rejuvenated so to speak or or, or uh, you know uh, or dug out uh, and has been rehashed um, so uh, early copd now gold says uh, is the term only used to discuss biological first steps in disease in an experimental setting personally i'm not sure what this means uh this definition um not that it matters but i i a I, i'm not sure what it means to clinicians and, and and i'm not sure that i agree with this term we'll come to that later uh young copd um is is in in patients it says who are uh, 
really uh, young as in uh, people uh, you know who are 20 to 50 i still think 20 is a bit too young uh, to label anybody uh, with copd um, but what do i know uh, and 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 pre copd is proposed to identify individuals who have respiratory symptoms and other detectable abnormalities in uh, in absence of airflow obstruction on force spirometry that's the important thing on force spirometry and these patients may or may not develop persistent airflow obstruction over time so i think uh, uh, that that's how they are defining uh, pre copd and i'll i'll explain to you later why one definition may be better than others uh, prism we have already discussed it's where you've got normal ratio but impaired spirometry and this is a completely separate group where patients can move between prism to normal spirometry or prism to copd uh, i wanted to highlight definition by martinez actually so this is a very good paper uh, in american journal by martinez et al uh, looking at uh, uh, early copd so they they called it early copd so early changes uh, leading to copd in studies that are younger than 50 years um, so they proposed early airflow limitation less than lower limit of normal although uh, i'll show you data subsequently that there is not much difference between uh, fe and fvc and fe and fv uh, less than 70% and lower limit of normal uh, they say compatible CT abnormalities, um, and they say rapid decline in FE when more than 60 mLs per year. My problem with this definition is that you are sitting in a clinic, you've got a patient who comes who is a smoker, you know, who, who is very symptomatic. What are you going to do? Are you going to tell them, you know, come back, you know, go and do a CT scan and come back in a year's time? We will measure your. Uh, we will measure decline your FU, and if it's more than 60, we'll say you may have COPD and then start treating. Um, so it's it's not really a helpful definition for clinicians. It might be a helpful definition in research setting, but this does not help clinicians. Uh, others, for example, Augusti and Bert have proposed alternative ways because they had these, uh, these reservations. Um, uh, they say that this would explode, exclude a group of people who have been never smokers, and it would also exclude people uh, who, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> because uh, individuals with lower lung function and higher prevalence of comorbidity, uh, and and it would also exclude people who are patients. Who don't have accelerated lung function and i think these are all very valid points and again as i said so although martin's definition is somewhat helpful it doesn't really help a practice inclination uh and then but it all again you know raise similar questions about that definition so just to summarize basically we still are not really sure whether to say early COPD or pre-COPD, when to call it, how do we diagnose it, how do we treat them, how do we follow them up. Um, so basically, we are dealing with unknown unknown, or are we? And, and I think that's where I'm hoping to present you some data and, 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 and maybe, you know, uh, help you, uh, help you change, uh, change your mind. Uh, So we'll have a review of literature. Uh, so I'll start with the spiromic study. So this was a large study. So more than 2,000 patients. So uh, age range from 60 to 70 and, and good amount of smoking, 40 to, 40, 40 to 55 pack year smoking history. Now, you wouldn't be surprised to hear that 50% of these patients were symptomatic, whether they were ex or current smokers. And those who were symptomatic had post bronchodilator atrophy ninety one percent compared to those who were asymptomatic. Um, they also underwent a high resolution CT scan, and a significant number of patients had uh, a significant proportion of patients with gold zero or or pre or early COPD had uh, um, some emphysema. But importantly, there was significant difference between the small airways disease 
uh, in those who were symptomatic and who were asymptomatic increasing age and more smoking history or high smoking history was associated with air flow obstruction which is not surprising now those who had normal lung function no air flow obstruction 42% of those were being treated by bronchodilators and 23% were on inhaled corticosteroids and as we look at this uh, figure on on right what it shows us is that in terms of uh, symptoms uh, those with preserved lung function again uh, you know compared to controls who never smoked those with preserved lung functions you know again were very you know their, their mean cat score was 10 so not too dissimilar to uh, current smokers with mild to moderate copd so what i'm trying to say here is that our spirometer that was developed 200 years ago with some modifications now uh, has not been able to differentiate between uh current smokers who uh, who are symptomatic but fvnbc ratio fvc ratio not more than or, or more than 70 and less than 70 so 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 uh, what i'm trying to say to you guys is that spirometry is good it's easy it's reliable it's validated it's extensively used um it predicts outcome and so on but it's not necessarily a sensitive tool and going further the spiromix data again what you can show is the uh, you know symptoms and exacerbations so you have got antibiotics glucocorticoids one or the other office or hospital visit and uh, you know severe exacerbation and what you can see is Uh, patients who had cat score 10 or more so that's the group in the middle here uh their symptom their uh, you know treat uh, disease was severe enough that they had very similar um uh, medication need to those with more mild to moderate copd uh but the spirometry again was not able to tell us that whether they have got that condition or not copd gene study it's a big study and uh, uh, basically you know number of data have come out of that this is one of the papers uh, in american journal from uh, but and colleagues and again mylan han uh, is, is 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 one of the authors on this so what that study showed is that actually gold zero they, that's the term that was used at that time gold zero had a decline of 41 mls uh, per year in fev1 stage 1 and 2 had 48 mls and stage 3 and 4 had uh, 25 mls so again uh, you know the gold zero patients they behave very much like copd in terms of their symptomatic we have just seen we have seen that they need lots of medications and what we are seeing now is there is drop in lung function what we also know from from again same authors from same paper is that when they they did some clever ct imaging actually what they did uh, was something called as parametric response mapping so they paired inspiratory and expiratory images and they they looked at functional small airways disease and emphysema and what they found is that uh, in in stage 0 copd that's the term i'm using again it's same as pre copd or 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 in this talks context early copd uh what the authors reported is that changes in the small airways um that were identified on ct scan uh they predicted a few even decline but emphysema although was present was not that significant a contributor to fev1 uh decline and this is uh, again we are talking in stage 0 and they had similar finding that uh, small airways disease was an important predictor of decline in 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 uh, uh, decline in fev1 and we are getting you know more and more uh, studies now where uh, even if patient they may have a bit of cough and even if they don't have sputum when you actually look at their ct scan 
you can see their airways thickened and filled with mucus. Uh, we'll, we'll look at another large study, uh, pretty large study actually. Um, so where they looked at clinical and radiological disease in smokers with normal spirometry. Uh, again, the, the disease that we are, the, again, the group we are interested in. Uh, so uh, so the, of the four and a half thousand patients or nearly four and a half thousand patients, 54% had, uh, uh, you know, goal zero. And goal zero group had worse quality of life measured by SGRQ and a lower six minute walk distance. Uh, so although they had normal spirometry, another large study shows that they were, it was associated with reduced quality of life, reduced exercise tolerance, uh, and also um, a, a, a proportion of those patients uh, had uh, gold zero group had uh, CT evidence of emphysema or airway thickening. You know, so again, um, it's it's important to remember that uh, you know two large studies have shown presence of symptoms associated with clinical uh, worse outcomes, including exacerbations and need for steroids, uh, poor quality of life, poor walk distance. Uh, now, uh, we have got another study which looks at prediction of acute respiratory exacerbation in current and for, uh, former smokers. Um, so, uh, so you have again um, 4,000 patients with gold zero COPD. So a big number. Uh, what you do see is they do get proportionally uh, uh, do get proportionally less exacerbations, but nonetheless still still high, and they also need hospital admissions as well. And the major predictor included. Uh, you know, the, the major predictor of hospital admission was what happened to them previous year, of course, presence of airflow obstruction uh, and, and, and poor, uh, poor quality of life. And the risks were similar for those with and without airflow limitations. So just again, highlighting that absence of spirometric airflow obstruction doesn't, you know, it's not in, in particular in the early stage, it doesn't have that prognostic value because it's not sensitive enough. Even without that, people continue to get symptoms and, and, and need treatments. Um, we will then look at some population-based screening code studies. So there are a number of codes, including UK MRC, Spaldia, Tesado, Arik, and I've, I've uh, given you uh, the reference here at the bottom where you can have a summary of these ref, uh, uh, code studies as well. And basically, what, what it shows is that in these cohort studies, um, between 7 to 10 percent of patients, or maybe sometimes 15 percent patients, had gold zero. And in those gold zero patients, 20 to 40 percent were symptomatic. And a couple of studies, the Oslo cohort study and the cardio cohort, particularly the cardio cohort, which is over a 30 year follow, uh, suggested that symptoms were associated with FE and decline and, and CT changes, uh, whereas the card, uh, cardiac cohort and an ERIC uh, cohort, they identified that uh, symptoms uh, were associated with increased risk of death. Again, these are cohort studies, so these are associations. I'm not claiming any causation here, but I'm highlighting the importance of symptoms. So. If you have got a symptomatic smoker, or if we have got a symptomatic smoker, even with normal spirometry, we need to take it seriously. So what have we looked so far? <coughs> Whatever we want to call it, we want to call it gold zero, pre or early COPD. You've got eight to 10% in population studies, high prevalence of symptoms, radiological changes, exacerbations, need for treatment, hospital admission, and risk of death. Now, uh, my slight bone of contention here is, if we say pre-COPD, um, would it potentially reduce our uh, inclination to intervene? I don't know. Uh, if you look at how, you know, if you look at cancer screening, 
if you look at rheumatology people have moved down and are looking for earlier disease and looking to modify disease or but you know cancer you know early disease uh, diagnosis cancer screening and so on is going ahead in rheumatology for example you are looking at uh, initiating treatment early so to avoid joint destruction not treat it or control it but to avoid joint destruction similarly i think we need to look at these patients and whatever label we give them we need to think about how do we look at treating these patients early smoking cessation of course is very 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 important uh, pollution environmental pollution occupational exposure again you know uh, will play a big role uh, you and i can can encourage our patient about smoking cessation we can lobby governments about um, about pollution and but where we can really make a difference or or even more difference is when we have that patient in front of us to treat them now coming to spirometry is spirometry the best uh, best tool really you know uh, it's it's effort dependent we know that obesity particularly you know once your bmi is more than 30 certainly approaching 40 it will reduce your vital capacity and therefore falsely give you a high fun vc ratio um and there are data coming out that use of force vital capacity could under diagnose in fact if we look at the table here uh so uh, what the authors did was they looked at different cutoffs they looked at the gold cupd cutoff with fev uh, if with fvc uh using gold cupd but just slow vc uh, rather than fvc and lower limit of normal fvc and you can see that when they used the slow vc as cutoff they were able to identify uh most uh, most number of uh, most number of patients really so i think that's the uh, uh, that's the that's the, that's the key here is is that we do want to look at different um uh you know what are the various other ways we can use to diagnose cupd uh, people have looked at of course if we uh, you know 25 75 as well uh, but again we haven't really moved out from something that is 200 years old uh, we have you know uh, you know we have moved on from chest x ray to ct to hr ct but spirometry uh you know we haven't really made much advances in that um so i just wanted to at this point uh talk briefly about rethink study which is one of the you know i'm sure you all know about it uh so this was uh, an american study and uh, marlon hans the, best, uh, the the first author published in new england journal um so data came out last year what 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 they did is to 42 to 80 year olds with more than 10 pack years smoking history uh, and and no air flow obstruction as per gold criteria so you know big study really um, you know 535 patients randomized to laba lama uh, and primary end point interestingly was four point reduction in sgrq now you will notice there is no mention of sgrq in inclusion criteria but somehow they went for uh, primary end point uh, as sgrq and it was a negative study because they did not find any difference in primary end point there was some improvement in lung function uh, with with uh, labalama interesting thing was cough and sputum were main symptoms for patients rather than dyspnea so again you know labalama by itself may not necessarily be that effective on on on, on certain lung sputum and um the other thing is that they didn't really use any objective test which was abnormal so everything so you know the, the test that they did use was was spirometry which was normal um whether they should have looked at vital capacity slow vc rather than forced it's interesting now people have been thinking about these things and and mira witless uh, so uh, uh, you'll know him he is the chap along with uh, james shamus who is uh, 
come up with the the ers uh, current criteria for ics in steroids of so eosinophil count of 0.3 so he and his colleague they 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 had proposed a treatment of cupd based on symptoms um so uh, it's not too dissimilar to the new goal but what they do is as a step 2 uh they look at high eosinophil count but they also look at chronic bronchitis symptoms so uh cough and sputum and they say consider rofloxacin and mucolytics and and i think you know i'm not suggesting we use this this is all but what we need to do is think about patient think about how are we you know what are their symptoms because not all cupd patients are the same you know so it's really important that we look at our patient individually or look at a uh, disease process in more detail and try and tailor the therapy um so so slightly tracking back so rethink was negative and one of the things that we talked about was they didn't have an objective uh, abnormal uh, test uh, so we so you know so where where do, where do we go next well um, we had done a small study with uh, indian uh, counterparts uh and and we had looked at opportunistically look checking airflow obstruction in those with with uh, uh, treated with osa and a small uh, this was a relatively small group and in even those with smokers with normal spirometry symptoms improved um but you will very you know quite rightly ask so what i mean it was a very sort of small study which sort of gave us some sort of uh, ideas to think about and the other question is how can we improve rethink so before launching into that just wanted to talk about oscillometry so oscillometry as you know is the new thing that is coming in it's effort independent but there are limited or no not not no but limited normative data really uh, this is a study uh, by chai wong where they looked at uh, smokers healthy subjects and cupd patients and just wanted to highlight the figures that they have used here so uh, particularly if we look at the bottom here of the table uh, they are saying that ax of 6.3 they are identified in chronic smokers whereas in healthy subject ax was 3.5 um we also know that dr salvis group has done a lot of work a large study uh, to see whether they can come up with individual cut off and again they felt that when they looked at x of more than uh, uh, x of more than 4 then area under curve uh, was uh, 0.70 similarly x5 gives you good area under curve of about 80% so potentially uh, you know and i'm sure if if we if we use uh, x maybe with area under curve you know at as 6 we might get slightly better area under curve um and these are the figures from dr salvi study and thank you dr salvi for i mean really 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 important study i think um again uh, uh so study by way et al uh, so basically if we if we look at the data here uh you know so particularly the bottom right hand corner if we look at the ax uh so here uh um, minus 1 0 1 2 3 4 would be uh so one would be 10 uh, kilopascal sorry uh, and and we can see that uh by uh, gold stage one patients have a x close to 10 um and there is there is a point as to why i'm i'm showing these uh, ax uh, and other data uh, oscillometry data to you guys um so we then looked at uh, a study uh, in 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 goal zero or pre or early cupd so we were in uh, we'll, we'll be doing it in india uh, study is about to start actually and and i thank all the partners particularly dr salvi dr dar and and dr kulkarni and all collaborators and our sponsors so there are 11 to 12 centers we aim to recruit 200 patients with smoking history of more than 10 pack years high cat score and normal spirometry uh the age will be compared to compared to the rethink study we have gone for much younger patients so 35 30 to 55 of course you know uh, 
uh, we don't want history of asthma and various other things and so on. Uh, so with that, they will have eggs of more than six. We'll look at baseline bloods and perform metabolomics. We'll do HRCT, and then they'll be randomized to ICS laba or placebo. It's a three-month study, uh, and 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 we'll be mainly looking at change in CAT score. So we hope that this is, um, you know, I'm sure researchers all over are going to uh, be looking at uh, the early or stage zero or pre CPD and 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 look at. Uh, how and how best to treat and whether ICS laba because laba lama study was negative so whether ICS laba or whether you know roflumilast or whether any other new mucolytics whatever you know could they be effective and of course smoking cessation we should not forget so this is an interesting area I think I have probably been you know uh, speaking for well over half an hour um, uh, but just wanted to uh, say that if you see patients who do fit the bill, then think about early COPD. Uh, and, and, and because there aren't, it's, it's important to counsel against smoking, but do treat them as well. Uh, normal, just because spirometry is normal, I'm sure we won't turn them away. Right, I will, I will stop here. Thank you for your patience. And... Uh, you know, if there are any uh, errors or anything, um, apologies for that. And uh, I'll, I'll, you know, well, I'll hand it over to Dr. Sanjeev and Dr. Sandeep. Shall I stop sharing? Yeah. yeah. So thank you, Dr. Milin, for a, an extremely thought-provoking presentation. You know, I was thinking of a lot of things and maybe good ideas for some of my post guys students to take up smaller studies. I mean, we can't, yeah. they can't do RCT, of course, but you know, some of the studies that could be taken up. Before I start the discussion rolling and get uh, Dr. Sandeep uh, Salvi in, just wanted to inform you that since the new gold, uh, we can't call it guidelines. You know, Salvi always starts his talk by saying that don't call them guidelines. They are not guidelines. Yeah. So, yeah. but still, you know, even though we don't kind of accept that they are not guidelines, but uh, there is a tendency in India to consider them as the gold standard and the things to follow. You know? So all said and done, despite all the efforts that Oxal we put in, we still can, kind of in our hearts consider it as a guideline. And having come to that, you know, often we we stick to the gold and say this is how it should be. So some of the audience there, you know, some of the people listening to you would be our postgraduate students. So before we start our discussion per se, for the postgraduate students, you know. I, I would tell you that you don't really have a choice. You have to stick to those definitions that Gold tells you. So uh, Dr. Milind was you know, very nicely pointing out some of the issues in the definition. I'm sure we'll bring in Dr. Sarvi later on discussing what are the issues in the way we put in those uh, names for the various categories that we discussed today. But as far as the postgraduates are concerned, as far as a theory question or a practical question, the examination is concerned, for you, uh, early COPD goal very clearly says, you know, that early COPD, just thinking of the term early, you could it could be biological early or it could be clinical early. And uh, what Dr. Milind has been discussing with us is mainly clinical early, which is not what Gold wants to call us early COPD. And Gold is still insisting that early COPD is actually biological early, which obviously a clinician cannot pick up, which can be picked up only on experimental basis based on the changes that occur early in a patient with COPD, which with a stethoscope or even with a spirometer, we are not going to pick up. So when you are asked a question in the exam on that, you will have to stick to that definition of early COPD. And uh, what Dr. Milind has been talking to us broadly is covered under the new term pre-COPD, which is where, you know, you have symptoms, you have the exposure to, for, for a clinician, it's more or less more like a COPD, but then you do a spirometry and the spirometry does not show the most important thing that you expect in a COPD which is a post-pronger dilative FEV1 by FEC less than uh, 0.7. So Gold says we call it pre-COPD. The reasons, I'll bring Dr. Salvi into that. Uh, so the reasons why and all, I'll ask Dr. Salvi to explain. But for our you know examination purpose, for academic discussion, we'll have to stick to that particular definition. Uh, what Dr. Millen told us as COPD in the young, obviously, is what the Gold also says. So that part of it, uh, there is... So with that introduction, Dr. Milan, I hope you understand why I wanted to no, say absolutely. that. Absolutely. And my, my apologies if I have caused any any problems or confusion for postgraduate. Not at all. Not at all. Anyway. My, 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 my. 
I'm sure the postgraduates also need to understand. So with that, you know, I'll bring in Dr. Salvi. In Dr. Salvi, you've been talking to us uh, multiple times in the you know past. I mean, recent past on these uh, definitions and the new goal terminology, which uh, we always enjoy. And uh, I would again request you once again to you know briefly tell us uh, in your words what is early COPD, what is pre-COPD, and what is PRISM, which are the three new terminologies which come in. So with that, we would start our discussion. Over to you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dyer, for those, uh, you know, for putting the context for this uh, discussion. And thank you, Milind, for uh, giving an absolutely brilliant, uh, thought-provoking talk, uh, highlighting a very important clinical area where many of us, we don't seem to have, uh, you know, enough scientific evidence to take any proper clinical decisions. So Dr. Nair, before I start, two, three things. One, the, the gold is a strategy report. So it's a strategy that all countries are, uh, I mean, they're free to accept, adopt, and then call them as guidelines. You, you may call them as guidelines, but the gold would like to call whatever they publish as a strategy report. Uh, now, two things before I really go ahead with the discussion. Out of 100 people who smoke, how many develop COPD? That is a question that, you know, is an important question. And uh, as a postgraduate student, uh, the, the textbooks that I read, the answer that I got was 15%. 15 to 20% of smokers develop COPD. Now, uh, the key point over here is how do you define COPD? So because if you use different criteria to call that person having COPD, then the proportion of uh, smokers who will be labeled to have COPD will change remarkably. So if you use a fixed ratio of 0.7 after a post bronchodilator test, yes, the proportion of uh, smokers who will have obvious or established COPD would be around 50. But if you use more sensitive parameters, and what I mean is if you use, say, for example, if you use small airways obstruction as, an, as a marker of what we would call as early COPD, then the proportion increases to 50%. So depending on which criteria you want to choose to define COPD, the proportion of smokers developing COPD will keep on changing. If you use a high, <clears throat> if you use a high resolution CT scan, then probably it will be even more. So the answer that 15% of smokers develop COPD, in my opinion, is not correct. This has been challenged many times in the literature. And by and large, if you look at uh, some of the recent uh, literature, defining COPD through uh, you know, early, uh, for early small airways obstruction, the proportion increases to 50%. So what proportion of smokers develop COPD? In my opinion, 50%. If you use the small airways uh, disease criteria. Now, this is an important learning for PG students. Second, uh, a real life uh, case, case study. So a friend of mine with whom I have spent uh, many, many years. Uh, unfortunately, he started smoking at the age of uh, 19, 18, 19, when he started going to college. And he smoked quite a lot. He smoked for about uh, 15, uh, 15 years. When uh, one day his wife called me up and said, uh, Sandeep, uh, this fellow is uh, really coughing up the whole night. More recently, he coughed up even a little bit of blood and we are really, really worried. He has been coughing on most days and more particularly during the winters, winter months. And he's just not willing to give up smoking because he believes that smoking is not affecting his lungs. So I said, please send him to my institute. At the time, it was the CRF. I will do his spirometry and I'm pretty confident that based on the symptoms that he has and the number of pack years that he smoked, I would be very confident to say that, yes, he has COPD. And then I would scare him with those numbers of spirometry and I would convince him to give up smoking based on that. So he came to see me the next day. I did spirometry and surprisingly, it was bang normal. I did post bronchodilator test and it absolutely made no difference at all. So perfectly normal spirometry with a smoking history of 15 years and symptoms which are very, very strongly suggestive of COPD. He tells me, Sandeep, see, I told you I don't have COPD. I told you that my lungs are healthy. My lungs will, will I'm, smoking is not affecting my lungs. 
and to be honest i had no <laughs> i had no evidence i had no scientific evidence to convince him that this is the wrong thing for you to cut the long story short i did not know what to do with him should i should i start him on treatment should i not start him on treatment what should i start what should i treat him on uh so i said i'm sorry i mean i probably i'll just give you some antibiotics assuming that this is an acute infection uh no inhaled medication and i'll probably see you on a regular basis i saw him after a few years and at that point of time he had frank copd now when i saw him first what should i have done i think i think that's where we are uh the the other key observation comes from the copd gene study where mylan han you know it's a fantastic study for 10000 smokers being followed over a period of time they want to find an answer for who are the smokers who don't develop copd and why is it that they, that they don't develop copd what is preventing them from developing copd that was the answer that they wanted to find so they've been following this people over a period of time at baseline all the 10000 people underwent spirometry and a high resolution ct scan and based on the spiro based on the spirometry definition 15% had copd so uh, if you use the if you want to if you see less than 0.7 then uh, 15% were established copd but when they did the hrcts they were surprised to find that 45 to 50% of them had radiological evidence of small airways obstruction small airways thickening which is uh, inflammation and uh, alveolar wall destruction so there is frank uh, uh, radiological sign suggesty of copd but the spirometry is not established so uh, i think that that study which was published in jama a few years ago actually started making people think that hey if you're going to rely only on spirometry then it is likely that you will miss a lot of happening copd developing copd developed copd but not yet established on spirometry that is what you will you are likely to see and then should you wait till the if you are upon fc ratio comes to less than 0.7 and then start the treatment uh, that's the very that's the critical uh, point where uh, it is a critical question uh, doctors don't know what to do uh, so because of that observation and a lot of the similar examples that perhaps even i saw many you must have also seen dr nair perhaps dr milan would have also seen a lot of these patients and you are in a bit of a soup because you, the spirometry is not telling you that it is copd so should you label them and should you treat them that is the reason why the gold committee uh, decided that you know it is time that uh, we start giving recognition and importance to this because the copd is a developing process maybe the disease is already developed but not developed enough to be picked up on spirometry but but we should do something during this process as well so uh, for the first time so as uh, milan very rightly pointed out gold had classified it as gold stage 0 and then there was a lot of criticism uh, about it a lot of a lot of the gold committee members themselves criticized and therefore you know with that noise it was removed almost the next year and then now we seem to have started realizing no no it was a wrong thing that we did we should not have re- removed the gold stage 0 we have just brought it back again with a new name called pre copd just like we have pre diabetes pre eclampsia pre hypertension pre there so many pre 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 things which merit attention and intervention so that is the reason why now it has been formally categorized as pre copd the rethink um, study was just uh, yes well just a quick quick uh, one there you know when we say pre diabetes that is because we have done hba1c and we have picked up a biochemical abnormality whereas pre copd or stage 0 these patients are symptomatic uh you know if it and and you know if it walks like uh, duck and it quacks like duck you know yeah. uh, as a smoker with cough and breathlessness and sputum they have at least got chronic bronchitis if not you know uh, <clears throat> so and that's why i think uh the the test that we are using is blind uh, or too blunt um and my slight again it, it doesn't matter what i think but my point is uh, calling something pre as opposed to early the only differentiation is is that it means 
you know you are more likely to act uh, and 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 do something because the the other thing is that the the second not the uh, peter and fletcher the other graphs we seen about the development of your uh, if you even somebody might actually and i'm sure you have seen we have seen number of people who have got if you know 120% yeah uh, so when you when you got if you know 120% and fn vc ratio of 78% even initially uh, who, uh, can you hear me Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, please carry on. Yeah. So, so after, so it might take a while before their FNVC ratio or FVC ratio comes back. Uh, and again, you know, the the question is whether FVC is the right measure or whether we need to look at FVF twenty five seventy five or or just you know FVN by VC ratio because yeah. uh, number of times with the FVN FVC normal, I've seen when you actually look at FVN VC, you actually do see. uh less than 70% you treat these people and symptomatically and sometimes pyrometrically they do improve yeah uh, the, the the point billing this uh, you know presence of symptoms presence of respiratory symptoms is very is a very sensitive parameter but unfortunately not very specific indeed, indeed. so if you start treating all the smokers having a cough with uh, you know believing that they have copd either established or uh, early or pre whatever you call it perhaps you would be over treating a large number of patients i think that's the problem i totally agree and the second is uh, fef 25 to 75 although is a good marker of small airways obstruction again uh, it's not very specific because a lot of you know asthma presence with uh, fef low fef 25 to 75 in the studies that we did you know about 40% 50% of indian of the of the indian community have small airways obstruction 50% and these are that is the three very large studies that we have done but i think so, we'll need to look at the normative data of the fef 2575 in indian population and then base uh, like we are doing for correct. for example oscillometry correct correct so right. what i'm trying to say is i'm not saying that everybody you know should be treated with icas or labalama what i'm saying is that we need to develop a more sensitive tool to differentiate between which of these patients uh have some objective abnormality uh and are more likely and, and, to and, and that's where i think the oscillometry will probably show us a signal yeah and uh, you know i'm it's it will probably not be too far away when uh, somebody will actually report this yeah. where oscillometry is picking up uh, you know objectively uh, small airways obstruction before even spirometry does yeah and and then that will be uh, that will be a game changer for uh, for management of these patients but dr nair i mean maybe we, your opinion would also be more important what do you do with these patients do you treat them or you don't treat them the symptomatic ones come to our op correct they come with correct. the symptoms they have the risk factors like you said some of them you know leave alone the spirometry and the history you know they even have a barrel chest and you know they have very obvious uh, disease yeah. but the spirometry doesn't help you in the diagnosis yeah. we have no choice but to treat these people so i think uh, now at the end of the day whether that treatment really helps in the long run we don't have any data on that but then they come to us with some symptoms and uh, sitting as a clinician i have no choice but to address those symptoms and i would feel that a safe medication would be a inhaled medication because it often works in these patients so i think uh, that is how it goes if i can just add one more point before i give it to you dr nair the rethink study was a very very important study that was looking at uh, the fact that should we treat these patients if we treat them does it make any difference to them uh, and i was i was greatly looking forward to the results of the study and uh, i was to be honest i was biased towards believing that the rethink study would come out to be positive and it would ch- it would be a complete game changer for you know early copd pre copd whatever you call it when i went for the gold uh, ad board meeting uh, uh, everybody seemed to be a little depressed and especially mylan han who was the lead uh, investigator for this uh, she was not she was very unhappy because uh, she did not find the rethink study to show any positive impact so these were so called pre copds were randomly selected they were treated with uh, laba lama versus a placebo 
and uh, followed over a period of six months. Now, I read the study very, very carefully. I really teased it apart. There are quite a few flaws in the study design. One is that a dose of the drugs that were used were on the lower side because the US FDA has approved only the low dose of uh, indicatorol. So they were, they were compelled to give the sub, the sub minimum, sub dose uh, to these patients. One. Second is I looked at the uh, MMADs, the mass median aerodynamic diameters of the indicatorol and glycopyronium. And they're all way about 2.5. So these are the drugs that will not reach the small areas. So you're giving sub doses of drugs which are unlikely to reach the small areas, which we, which we believe is a place where the pathology is actually happening. And then we use only symptoms as a as a primary endpoint to look for differences. So I think and not only symptoms but SGRQ. Uh, so if you look at the initial SGRQ, it wasn't that deranged to start with. So, so to get a four point improvement in that. Yeah, and uh, you know, Milan, I so there, there were twenty patients uh, who did not uh, give the SGR, so they had to be dropped. And about a significant number of these patients, because of the ongoing COVID pandemic at that time, they were interviewed on the telephone for the SGRQ. Now imagine SGRQ is how many questions? It's about a hundred questions, eighty questions, hundred questions. And you're sitting on the phone and asking, okay, now have you this, have you this, have you this? Now, which patient is likely to give you the real, the truth answers? So I believe that could be one of the reasons why the signal be between the treated arm and the placebo arm was not, there's no, there's no good signal because of the, the, the tool and the technique of uh, collecting the data. So there are a lot of, I believe, a lot of drawbacks in the study, which uh, give me some hope that uh, you know i think it would be important to treat these patients as dr nair said you have to treat them you can't leave them alone and say hey sorry your spirometry is normal i can't i can't treat you as a copd you can't do that but then uh, if you treat them do they benefit i think the uh, the can cold study the other studies have clearly shown that if you treat them the number of exacerbations go down the symptoms get better hospitalizations reduce so those are just observational studies. There's, there's no randomized control trial longitudinally to give us that information. But I think logic teaches us that they're likely to benefit. And that's where the study that you have designed, I mean, in the IECAN, which is uh, exactly looking at these patients, it's a landmark study. I mean, in India, we're doing it uh, perhaps one of the few, one of the first centers in the world to uh, do a randomized control trial of early COPD. And and I'm excited about this. We are going. We are using. I think we have we have designed the study a lot better than what the rethink study was designed. The COVID pandemic is over, so we will get more objective evidence of the the truth. And uh, we are also using oscillometry. So that's it. I think oscillometry. I'm I'm hoping that that will give us an abnormal, you know, hard fact that we. Sorry, Doctor Nair. I think. <laughs> I've, I've, sp I've spoke a lot now. I think that's yeah, it's, 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 it's very, very, very valid, important points that you raised. But before we go into our own discussion, per se, I'll just take one of the questions that came in, which is kind of related to what we were discussing so far. So, so uh, the question whether routine screening of uh, people in this question here, the age suggested is 65 years with no or minimal symptoms be done. So, I mean, I'll start with the answer myself. I mean, uh, See, what we have been discussing so far is people with exposure and symptoms. Now, if you're asking a question on routinely screening people with spirometry when they have no symptoms at all, I think there are a lot of analysis and studies in the world which show that totally asymptomatic people, even when they are smokers or when they have exposure, if you actually screen them, the benefits out of that such kind of screening is often uh, not very, uh, you know, too much. But of course, if somebody has symptoms and somebody has exposure, then obviously that person fits into our criteria of doing a spirometry. Then we do a spirometry. What we are discussing today is that of those people, many would have a spirometric abnormality, which makes them, gives them a diagnosis of COPD, but a significant proportion who should be you know, called COPD as, as per all of us would not have that abnormality. And there we would have to use the term either pre-COPD or early COPD or whatever. So that is there any anything you want to add, Dr. Salvi, to that on the screening? No, I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head. 
uh, asymptomatic patients don't waste your time effort and money in screening them but if they're symptomatic and have exposure to risk factors by all means please screen every patient for a potential diagnosis of underlying COPD. And the other question, I think, uh, again, which is something that uh, Dr. Milind was uh, discussing early, earlier, was uh, what is the age group at which to suspect COPD? I mean, traditionally for undergraduate teaching, we would suggest, you know, 35 years, 40 years, but I think there is no cutoff like that where you actually suspect COPD. Dr. Milind was actually so, talking about that 20 years cutoff. Any so, Milind, Milin, if you see uh, girls in the rural areas, you know, they're exposed to biomass smoke uh, since they're seven, eight years old. They help their mothers during the cooking. And so by the time they become 20, 25, they've already been exposed to a good old 10, 15 years of exposure. So we have seen a lot of these young COPDs, uh, especially, especially women who have been exposed to biomass for a long time. Uh, so 25-year-olds, 30-year-olds, we have seen quite a few of them having underlying COPD. For tobacco, it's understandable, you know, because nobody starts smoking at the age of 10. You start smoking at the age of 20. And then you need at least 10, 15 years, 20 years of smoking to get the COPD. And therefore, in the Western world, they say 40 years. But I think in our part of the world, COPD occurs at a much younger age than that. So, uh, so I, I agree with that uh, uh, in terms of, you know, the, the biomass exposure the uh, biomass fuel exposure. The other thing is very poor ventilation. They're very true. So And uh, the, uh, the third thing is uh, chronic malnutrition or suboptimal nutrition. So uh, low birth weight, uh, you know, having... Ma having maternal exposure to smoke and so on, good. all contribute. All One good. of the questions I had around that and, and I, you know, not that you or I have time, but uh, something I really am a, sort of interested in is to look at is to what extent the smoking, the biomass exposure related uh, airway obstruction is fixed versus reversible. So if you remove the person completely away from that uh, biomass fuel exposure, or if you put one of the things that I, I was talking to a, a close friend and a colleague of mine who works in tribal India, and again, they have very high incidence of COPD, is whether we could look at putting a couple of windows for cross ventilation if we can't, or, or you, you know, providing, I mean, you know, so some gas or, or something like that to minimize biomass exposure. Uh, would that, what impact would that have? Uh, on lung function and any recovery of lung function? That's a very good question. So what what we found, I mean, we have done a study in, I mean, I'm sure Dr. Nair has also done a lot of studies in this, in the community. But when, when you see a fixed airflow obstruction, you know, after a bronchodilator, the ratio is still less than 0.7. That is a defining criteria for COPD. In fact, Dr. Nair always says, spirometry diagnosis only one condition, only one condition. The rest, it's, it gives you useful information for you to make up uh, your underlying diagnosis. But COPD is the only diagnosis that spirometry makes. It doesn't make any other diagnosis. So, uh, well, if if COPD, if the spirometry makes a diagnosis of COPD, uh, you assume that they will not reverse over a period of time. Uh, what happens to the young women after they have, uh, after they, you know, get, get away from the exposure to biomass? Uh, does the lung function stabilize? Do they get better? There seems to be some evidence, uh, Milan, that these patients actually tend to get better if the exposures are stopped. And if the exposures have to be stopped for quite some time. And in fact, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Nair, the Ujwala Yojana scheme that the Prime Minister has initiated, where all the rural people are now getting subsidized uh, LPGs, cylinders, uh, I believe it will have significant impact amongst those who use it on a regular basis. How is it them possible? It and they still continue to use biomass. But the is remaining it possible then to maybe go to places where you know people are going to get targeting and and see what their you know uh, before and after Ujwala or or you know the LPG. Yeah. So one know, of one of my PhD one of one of my PhD students has just completed this work. 
and uh, so he is going to publish it and i've seen the data and it looks very promising dr nair you know you when you give them a lpg cylinder and at least for a year the lung functions actually tend to get better over, uh, over that one year period so uh, with its reversible it probably is yeah i think uh, dr salvi is also referring to the fact that we have published from the pure study in india with five centers covering from the south to the north and uh, in the re, you know the last 10 15 years we have seen that uh, the use of safe fuel has really improved in india people have moved over from the safe, so called unsafe uh, fuel to the safer fuel which has not really happened in the neighboring countries so you know we have a control with other countries in the area as well so this has really happened in uh, india and uh, dr salvi is going to bring out uh, good information on what happens afterwards you know after seeing uh, but then i think uh, the current uh, availability of lpg and all is too recent for us to even analyze in a long term is probably we'll have more information as time passes he made another very valid point that they continue to use the lpg now what actually i have also seen in villages that many people after they get it and for some time you know they go back to this the other thing that milind what you raised is you know we we have had many schemes in india looking at increasing you know making it safe chulas increasing ventilation using other means like uh, solar cookers and all that and i personally feel and i think there are studies also which show that they really don't make an impact so the, okay. probably what can make an impact is like what dr salvi said you change the fuel give them a yeah. good alternative which is uh, if it is cheaper they would definitely use it also so i think that is enough uh just uh, one more question before we i think we we are also running out of time uh, so dr salvi and dr nilind i mean uh, having said that you know we, we sort of all of us agreed that uh, even if the spirometry is normal when they have symptoms and exposure we would actually treat them your study that you mentioned you are looking at ics lab uh, some of the other alternatives you would be looking at would be at uh, any bronchodilator or even a combination bronchodilator the other one that was mentioned earlier was indacapril which is yeah. taking it to that other extreme you know, you're looking at a lava lama combination which is what we would use in a severe form of copd so yeah. why would you actually use it in a mild copd uh, and in that context you know the question you could maybe take the question also it's not really related to our topic but the question goes on how you would actually you know uh, uh, how long would you continue a lava lama which you started as copd i think we wouldn't have a definite answer to that we have a exacerbation pathway and uh, dyspnea pathway which tells us how to step up and how to modify but i think nowhere gold actually suggests uh, unlike in asthma how you step down a inhaler if your patient is better so but in this case I, it's early copd so you start maybe ics lava your studies for three months or maybe even a, you know maybe a single bronchodile or a double bronchodile whatever you feel is good for how long would you give it i mean patient obviously may, may or may not improve but would i continue so like for so you the the answer uh, to that uh, having having seen some of these patients and i'll tell you both where you know it worked and it didn't work so uh, usually by 6 weeks you should see a difference um and if a patient by 4 to 6 week hasn't improved with your inhaled therapy because it's not unusual that you can get viral infection and you will have extra mucus production and cough and unwellness for a while and then things settle down but you know so patients will come back so i would bring them back at 6 weeks uh and look at at least clinical examination and questions if not for the imaging to see and make sure that i'm not missing something uh, if by that time the inhaler hasn't made any difference uh then it is less likely to make difference again there are no studies apart from re- you know rethink so this is uh based on my clinical practice and experience rather than any data but 6 weeks maybe 8 weeks if in that time that medication hasn't worked then it's unlikely uh to work the other possibility sometimes is uh and an occasionally we have seen is whether oral steroids might help but they tend to be more sicker patients uh, rather than uh, patients you see in outpatient clinic uh, with normal spirometry uh, so 6 weeks maximum 8 if it hasn't you know made a difference by then then i would uh, stop that treatment and and make sure that 
I look at alternative diagnosis as well, just to make sure I'm not missing something. Dr. Salvi, any thoughts on this? Yeah, so if you look at one of the biggest changes that happened in the recent gold strategy report is the deletion of ICS plus LABA as an option in the treatment. Now, that uh, many people seem to not like it because uh, especially in India, a lot of COPD patients are treated with ICS LABA. Now, the, if you look at the non-smoker COPD, uh, they are more likely to respond to inhaled corticosteroids for various reasons. Uh, you know, we, we did a study that showed that they have high sputum eosinophil counts and therefore they're more likely to respond to inhaled corticosteroids. Others seem to have shown that there is ex there is greater exhaled, fractional exhaled nitric oxide in non-smoker COPD than uh, smoker COPD. So there, is seem there seems to be some reasonably good justification to say that at least the non-smoker COPD, I'm not talking about the smoker COPD, may benefit with ICS plus lava. And uh, this uh, real-world study that uh, was done with, with CIPLA uh, a couple of years ago, the non-smoking COPD showed a dramatic response with uh, a triple drug combination, uh, which contains an inhaled corticosteroid. The improvement was as high as 800 to 1,000 ml in FEV1. Now, this is unheard of in patients with COPD, but they had established COPD. I mean, F post bronchodilator f upon FEC was less than 0.7 in this patient. Despite that, they showed a very big improvement. So, so again, I think I would challenge the diagnosis of COPD there. Yeah, uh, but then what do you, so what do you call it? post bronchodilator f upon FEC less than 0.7. So, so you will have a number of asthma FEC. patients who are in a phase where you know your 400 ml of salbutamol will not do anything correct yeah uh, you know yeah, so so we can debate whether this is copd whether this is acos whether this is asthma copd overlap whatever it is but uh, is ics plus lab a good starting point for these patients or should we treat them with uh, maybe a bronchodilator uh, or a combination of bronchodilators I really do not know dr nair maybe maybe your experience will give us some some sense of direction what works in these patients? Yeah, I, I think uh, we, we are in the stage of trying. I mean, if uh, if we are looking all all put together, if we are looking at not giving ICS lava in the, even in the more severe forms of COPD, then, you know, again, would you give it to the milder forms of COPD, particularly, you know, if there's a higher risk of pneumonia and TB in India, I mean, they're giving, so that is a debatable thing. But then again, if you're giving a bronchodilator also, I mean, for the mildest form, would you again go to the, I mean, you go to group A, you're giving any bronchodilator, group B, you're stepping up and group E, you're stepping up again. So this is group zero or I mean, whatever you can, the alphabet which comes before A. So again, would I go with the higher, you know, option in that? I think it's like you said, you know, only time will tell us whether something would work and how good I mean, Dr. Millen's study would come out something. You know. and Since we are running out of time, I'll just take the couple of questions. Dr. Millen, yeah, keep some keep coming. I think the also, you know, Again, on a number of things, including this ICS question, I don't agree with the um, gold report or whatever we want to call that. Um, the clear data with 0.3 of eosinophil, even going up to 0.2 improvement uh, in various outcomes and improvement with triple. Um, so personally, I think you know that report is flawed, and I'm sure you know number of people will think that. The other thing is what has happened is in COPD studies, people ha ended up using very high doses of inhaled corticosteroids, which are not necessary. You don't need 800 ml, uh, you know, 800 micrograms of bidosonide twice daily. Um, you know, so that's the other uh, point. But I'm sure over like like uh, stage zero is coming back under a difference, guys. Now, in next or next after that. They might bring in ICS, you know, where they say check eosinophil count or pheno right at the start. And if it's, you know, more than 25 or 50, whatever the cutoffs come out or 0.3. So, Dr. Nair, you know, what excites me the most is the possibility of ultra fine, extra fine drugs for the treatment of both early COPD as well as established COPD. Absolutely. I perhaps that could be a game changer because we all know it's all recognized. But COPD is a disease that primarily affects the small areas, even in the early stages. Absolutely. And, and therefore, you know, giving drugs that actually reach the target would be the key. 
And I think that's where we need to, that, that's a direction that we need to take. I think another question was on uh, the alternatives to, you know, using that fixed ratio and somebody was suggesting whether LLN or a Z score would be better. I think that would not really make a real difference to our pre-COPD versus COPD definition. Like you said, your uh, oscillometry may make a difference, but uh, not the spirometry interpreter would be different. Would you uh, agree? Yeah. Uh, Again, I think whenever, so in most cases, using one cutoff might be helpful. But I think what, what we lose in that is we lose the understanding of any, you know, any value, whatever value you take, you know, most things are bell-shaped. So you need to know where you are sitting in that population to see what cutoff you will use. Uh, second thing is that we also need to know what FEV1 you started with to know how you, we interpret your FEV1 today. Um, so, like anything, I mean, you know, we look at CT scans or whatever. So, so you have to put that information in context. If, if when it comes to either legal or definition for research, that's fine. But when you've got a patient sitting in front of you, you have to look at not just one number in the whole readout. But you have to take into, you know, if, for example, if somebody, you know, 40 pack year smoking history, coughing sputum, uh, you know, you can hear V's on their chest and their F even by VC, not FVC ratio is abnormal with uh, if you have 25 centipede being low as well. Uh, then you put all that and say, OK, that all is more towards a diagnosis of airflow obstruction and I'll treat it. Uh, if you look at number of so rheumatic fever, for example, diagnosis, so you would have major criteria, minor criteria, and four major and two minor. Uh, in the rush to make it easy, I think we may have sort of lost something in terms of just coming up with one number to diagnose COPD. And we may have to say, okay, you've got four major and two minor, I don't know, you know, something like that. Uh, um, you know, then you know, uh, so, you you would consider or you would give a trial of treatment and review. Yeah. To, to answer to the debate about LLN versus a fixed ratio, uh, Surya Bhatt, who is an Indian origin pulmonologist who is based at the University of Alabama in Birmingham, USA, he found the answer for that. And I think uh, he's, he showed a very convincing uh, study that did a head-to-head -head comparison between uh, fixed ratio versus LLN or in a longitudinal manner. And he was able to show that the fixed ratio is as good or perhaps even better than the LLN to make a uh, clinically relevant diagnosis of COP. So Gold now has <coughs> decided that it will not even consider the LLN criteria. LLN for the, Also for the LLN, you need very good quality local predicted values, which we don't have. And if the fixed ratio is good enough, I think it makes life very easy for everybody. Uh, but are we missing a lot of COPD because of the 0.7 fixed uh, cutoff value? The answer is yes. And maybe the oscillometry will give us some signal to say that, you know, I am more sensitive than you to, to pick up a COPD earlier. I think that will happen. It's just a matter of time. Uh, so think, uh, with uh, LLN, I agree. Number of studies have shown the same thing. I was talking more about the slow VC rather than LLN. Yeah, point well taken. I think we are running out of time since the last three minutes. So before we conclude, I'll just read out, you know, Dr. Ed Dabawala from Gujarat. Uh, he just uh, slamming the difficulties of a clinician. You know, what do you do with unavoidable exposure? I'm, I'm sure he means the outdoor air pollution in India which you cannot reduce and your patients are regularly exposed to. He's also speaking about people refusing to stop smoking. Uh, we all understand that smoking cessation is a big challenge and we have to keep doing it all the time. You know, I mean, despite all our efforts, the acute rates may be around 30-40%, but still there is no other option than continue trying to convince our patient. Burning problem, you know, burning of waste and so many other things. So all these problems are genuine problems which we all face in our practice. So, I can only say that I agree with uh, your question and I think we all face those problems and we have no other options but to manage our patients in the midst of all that. With that, uh, we'll stop with the final comments from Dr. Salvi and uh, Dr. Uh, Melin the, before we close. One minute each and then we'll close. 
So if I can go first, Pilan. Yes, <laughs> please. please. So I I believe pre COPD is 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 a reality. Uh, it is important to diagnose uh, COPD uh, before it is well established. Uh, oscillometry is likely to be the uh, a better solution than spirometry to pick it up, and uh, ultrafine particles or extra fine formulations of uh, bronchodilators or inhaled corticosteroids will likely be more important or more useful in this population. Uh, so these are the two three comments that I wanted to make before we finish. Thank you, thank you, Doctor Sabri Milan. Anything last comments? You know, I, I you know, I completely agree with uh, Sandeep. uh and and i think you know exciting times in terms of oscillometry lie ahead uh looking forward to what uh, you know to start the study and see what the data show uh and i would like to thank icas uh, and in yourself dr sanjeev and of course uh, dr salvi it's, it's been a pleasure um i hope i haven't said anything too wrong or you know sometimes i can get a bit carried away in debate so uh, but uh, it's uh, it was all done in uh, good good intentions the pleasure of milin the listening to the past i listened to you speak on sleep so you know to more uh, discuss to a totally different area that we discussed today pleasure listening to you a very thought provoking session that we had dr salvi as usual you know simplifying concepts so well and you know making it so clear for us uh, i'll also thank ics for this opportunity bringing all of us together to discuss a very important topic i also would reemphasize what dr salvi said it's a reality that we will face we still don't know what would be the ideal way of managing these patients but we all agree that there should be something that should be done for these patients and uh, definitely you know i'm sure uh, with dr villan and dr salvi are all working on this area further maybe in the next few years we'll also have a better idea on So with that, I'll close and I'll hand over to Angela to summarize and close the session. Thank you so much, Dr. Nair. We are really grateful to you and Dr. Milind and Dr. Salvi on behalf of ICS. We really want to tell you how grateful we are. Dr. Milind has joined us from UK. Of course, there's a time difference, and he's always been so supportive with us. And there couldn't be a better person than Dr. Salvi to speak on COPD, of course. and uh, thank you so much as for our viewers i would like to tell you all that uh, please join in large numbers and if you have not registered for napcon yet please do that uh, because we do not have a lot of time left for registrations and uh, if you have any queries questions you can contact us at uh, ics office executive at the gmail.com you can email us and uh, next we will come back with a webinar on niv on 27th of august from 7 pm onwards So as we do these programs and webinars every fortnight we hope to have your support and for our faculties thank you so much we hope to see you all again soon discussing and passing over such informative information to all our viewers thank you so much thank you thank, thank you. you dr nair thank you dr melit thanks bye bye